am honored to read today's passage, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region, and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me, one will come more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, baby. Good morning, M1. How are we doing this morning? If you're watching online, good morning. The, uh, I'm excited to start this series. I'll explain a little bit the genesis of it in a little bit. I did not pick the Gospel of Mark because my first name is Mark. I know a lot of people have been talking that. That's not the reason why. The, um, uh, but we sent a survey out this past week and just asked for some input in terms of your experience with, actually with the Gospel of Mark. I want to thank you, those for, uh, who responded on that. We want to have a text going out at 1 o'clock today if we have your number. Uh, we got a text going out and encourage you to read the Gospel of Mark with us. Uh, it's actually the QR code on the screen, but that text will go out. The, uh, we have about one-third who have not read through the Gospel of Mark in the last uh, 10 years or so, or ever. But we have two-thirds that say they really don't have a good handle on it. Uh, we did a quick Google search on it. Uh, to read the entire Gospel of Mark will take you one and a half to three hours, depending on your reading speed, or also known as three episodes of Ted Lasso. So now you know how long it would take you to actually watch it. But before we get to it, let's talk about the power of God's Word. Let's talk about what we're actually looking at. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us about God's Word. It's living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, obviously metaphorical there. You don't need to wear Band-Aids or, or gloves when you're handling your Bible. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit. Can you divide soul and spirit? Probably not exactly, but it's, it's making a point that it's going gonna, it's gonna to get in there. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Are you ready to have your attitudes and thoughts of your heart judged? Okay, harsh start. We'll find a softer passage. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Yeah! Who's ready to be corrected, rebuked, and trained? Who wants to hear God's word? The whole key of the series is we get Jesus right. That we get Jesus right. If we don't get Jesus right... See, the foundation of our faith is not a, not a magic book. It's not a book that we think is perfect. The foundation of our faith is a man who's risen from the dead. The foundation of our faith is a person, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Without the resurrection, we have no reason to even pay attention to who he is or what he did or what he said. With the resurrection, now our faith, he is our foundation. If we're going to look into the scriptures, the scriptures point to him. The whole key is that we get Jesus right. And we're going to find a lot of people in the book of Mark that did not get Jesus right the first time. So as we look over this, I need taught. Do you want a pastor that thinks they're beyond being taught? Do you want a pastor that knows, I never need rebuked. I'm too mature in my faith. We want a biblical view of Jesus, not a cultural view of Jesus. And there'll be things that we look in the scripture that will... Offends you. Oh God, no, no way, Pastor. Jesus never offend me. If Jesus always agrees with you, what kind of Jesus do you have? Does he always vote like you, always agree with you? That's amazing. I did not know you were Jesus. You don't look like Caleb. 
So in preparation, I go on an annual prayer and study trip where when I come out of it, I try and have the preaching calendar ready for the year, at least roughed out. And even leading up to my prayer and study trip, which was in the middle of November 2023, normally I take stuff to study 15 or 20 different sermon series to kick it around. I only took the Gospel of Mark and, I, and, con, and ideas on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, just on that trip, I went through it seven times. I've been over it 35 times in 15 versions. I've watched dramas where a dude gets up and presents the entire Gospel of Mark as a monologue, movies on the Gospel of Mark. The, uh, uh, the idea is, let's get Jesus right. All I've, all I've read in my Bible since the last six months has been the Gospel of Mark, over again and again and again and again. And listening to it in whatever version you version had, I've heard audible versions where it's a... Uh, a female accent, a black lady accent, a, a, a white a Shakespearean accent. I listened to one Lutheran version where they sang the gospel. And chapter one took 20 minutes to get through. The, uh, but we got to get Jesus right. If we don't get Jesus right, it's like taking off on a, on a, on a flight from uh, New York or Cleveland. Let's go Cleveland to London. And if you don't get... London, right, is the where it is. You're just 2% off. You're going to end up in Istanbul, man. Or you're going to end up in Norway or Iceland and watch the northern lights instead of landing in London and eating horrible food. The, um, so if we're going to get Jesus right and we look in the Gospels, you know who got Jesus right in the, in the Gospel of Mark? Demons. Demons got Jesus right. The Roman centurion who saw Jesus die, he got Jesus right. The Greek woman from Syrophoenicia who wasn't a Jew, wasn't looking for a Messiah, she got Jesus right. You know what got Jesus wrong? The religious leaders and the disciples. Those who thought they knew the most got him wrong the worst. Are you willing to come to the scriptures with an open heart and an open mind and the willingness to be pushed back? The willingness for the word of God to push back at you. So this past week was a pretty amazing week. There was a lot to be amazed about. And as I kept going over the Gospel of Mark, the most common word in the Gospel of Mark is not amazed. The most common word in the Gospel of Mark is the. Okay? The and and Jesus. But I kept coming across regularly the word amazed. 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 The most common response to Jesus seemed to be amazement. And it wasn't always positive amazement. Pilate was amazed that Jesus didn't reply. People were amazed. What is this new teaching? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Did you hear what he just said? Who then can be saved? They were amazed. Where did this man get this? We know who he is. We know where his family comes from. We know who, where he's from. They were amazed at him. We've never seen anything like this. They were amazed, totally amazed. He is out of his mind. That was his family. And they were amazed. So everything that I've studied, everything that I've looked at, don't expect anything original whatsoever. I don't care about originality. I just want to be effective. But here's my one original thought. No one has no opinion on Jesus. No one has no opinion on Jesus. So let's take a quick look, a concise overview of the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark is actually the first gospel. No, it's not, Pastor. I know my New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew's first. Matthew's first in the order of the New Testament. Mark was written first. If this is a timeline, Mark was written first. And then, uh, whether it's Luke or Matthew, not sure, John definitely was written last. Mark was written around A.D. 55 or 65. A couple reasons we know Mark was written first. It's used as a source for the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. There's 678 verses in the Gospel of Mark. That's absolutely irrelevant, right? Who cares? All of the verses in the Gospel of Mark are used in Matthew, Luke, and John, except 31. 95% of what the is in the Gospel of Mark shows up in the other Gospels. That's not true about what's written in Matthew showing up in the other Gospels, what's written in Luke shows up in the other Gospels, or what's written in John shows up in the other Gospels. Veracity and evidence that Mark was written first. It's used as a source. It's the shortest Gospel, which makes sense. 
that it's the first one. Because when you read the Gospel of Mark, if you know your Bible a little bit, you may go, wait a second, when Jesus was tempted, didn't this happen and this happened and this happened? It did. Mark kept a lot of things out. Well, I don't know. Maybe he didn't feel the need to share everything. But when Matthew and Luke saw Mark's gospel, they realized, oh, man, I can add this. I can add this. And you ever notice when, you, when you're cooking something or writing something, it's easier to make it bigger and longer and more. It's hard to cut it back. <laughs> Don't you wish that I would cut my messages back sometime? You'll be really glad I cut this one down. I could go 70 minutes. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. The audience is, pro- is the Christians in Rome. Now, it's Rome. It's not a Jewish territory, Right? Mostly what Mark is writing to are non-Jews. We, the Bible calls them Gentiles, but we just know them as non-Jews. That's why there's almost none of the Old Testament quoted throughout the entire Gospel of Mark. Matthew, loads of Old Testament quoted. Why? Matthew's writing to Jews. The author's name is actually not Mark. It's John Mark. Because that's, how, that's what his name went by. But they just called him Mark. I'm really glad because we already have in the Bible the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So I'm glad they called it Mark. Mark is not one of the 12 disciples. Mark is someone who accompanied Paul, and Mark worked with Peter in Rome. And because of that, he pretty much became Peter's interpreter. So the source for Mark's gospel is the Apostle Peter. As best as we can look at it and understand it, almost all of his material comes from the Apostle Peter. But we don't call it the gospel according to Peter. Peter has the, was the eyewitness. Uh, John Mark was not. Mark mentions Peter more than any of the other gospels. Nothing happens in the gospel of Mark where Peter is not present. That's not accurate about Matthew, Luke, or John. The Gospel of Mark is most certainly the eyewitness testimony of Peter. But why were the Gospels written anyway? Because they weren't written until, this one wasn't written until AD 55 or 65. Jesus has been dead 20, 30 years. Why did they even write it? Well, because originally they didn't. The Gospels and the story, the Gospel meaning good news about Jesus. Good news, it's not advice, it's news. Why was it even written? Because they just spread things verbally and audibly. Because the eyewitnesses were still alive. If someone wanted to distort Jesus, I saw him ride on a magic carpet and go from place to place. Eyewitness could say, no, you were high on something, but no, 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 no. He did not fly on a magic carpet. I know that. I was there. But those eyewitnesses started to die off. And a Jesus we make up cannot transform your life. We need one that actually lived and died and resurrected. And if we don't write it down, people could create their own version of Jesus. I have a piece of his magic carpet. Send a donation to my ministry now, lay hands on it, and you'll be healed. And the apostles, the early church realized, we've got to get the apostles' eyewitness testimony written down. We've got to get it credibly written down. And so Matthew does that, Mark does that, Luke does that, John does that. Why? So we can avoid creating a self-serving Jesus that can't transform your life. What Jesus are you following? A scriptural one? Or one that's maybe got some scriptural background and one that we like to keep adapting to ourselves so that way he always thinks what we think and votes what we, how we vote and doesn't like who we don't like. we got to get Jesus right. That's all that really matters as we're going through this entire series. So let's say you're ready, Mark's ready to start. Mark, John Mark. He's got all of Peter's stories, whether Peter's there dictating to him or whether he's just getting ready to write down all, everything he's learned from Peter. Blank sheet. Where do you start? Isn't that one of the most intimidating things in the world? To hit a stationary golf ball with people watching you. To hit a pitched baseball while people are watching you. To back up a truck with a trailer while people are watching you. Or a blank sheet of paper. And everything that you know where do you start? Well, Matthew, Matthew decides to start by saying, hey, lots of people had lots of intimate relations, and so-and-so begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so. That's where Matthew starts. Luke starts with, hey, let's talk about Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, and how Zachariah and Elizabeth couldn't have kids. And let's start about that. And then let's talk about Mary and Joseph and how they uh, were dating and uh, engaged and divorced and thinking about divorce, and they finally get, and Jesus doesn't show up until chapter 2. And John says, ha, let's start at the creation of the universe. But none of them had read Mark yet. It hadn't been written. Where do you start? What's he going to leave out? You can't write everything in. Where's he going to start? So he starts plainly, clearly, 
and at full speed. The beginning of the gospel, which means good news. That's what the word literally means, good news. Not good advice, good news. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. My name is Mark Lehman. My first name is Mark. I'm the only one in my family named Mark. My last name is Lehman. That's what all my other family members are named. Jesus was named Jesus. Christ is a title. It would be more accurate in our language to say Jesus the Christ. But culturally, we understand when it says Jesus Christ, that's what it's referring to. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the anointed one. Jesus the empowered one. Would all mean pretty much the similar things. The Son of God. But Mark's getting ready to tell us he's not just... He's not just the Christ. He's not just the Messiah. People are looking for a Messiah. He's more than that. And the Son of God, yeah, he's the Son of God. And, but sometimes in Scripture, the Son of God can be ambiguous. Uh, it refers sometimes to angels in the Old Testament. And the sons of God were walking among men. And, and so Mark's getting, ready to, Mark's getting ready to throw down a gauntlet and to shock everybody, actually. And this is where we'll take the purpose of our message today, not just to teach you, because if I just teach you and give you information, you can get that on YouTube. But now it's time to start stepping on toes a little bit and let God's word rebuke us a little bit and realize Jesus is who he says he is and invite you to the altar to respond. Jesus is the king, not a king. He is the king as in the Ohio State University. He is the king. Let's follow along in the passage. Mark goes Old Testament on everybody. It's written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, we know that. I, those, those Jews, they were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for somebody to come, and, and there was going to be some Elijah kind of guy going, hey, he's here, hey, he's here. Because there's always, when somebody important comes, there's always someone, a town crier that comes before and announces, hey, they're here, they're here, everybody, they're here. Hark the herald angel sing. It's called a herald. It's a herald. There's a messenger. Yeah, we got that, we got that, we got that. He will prepare your way. Yeah, we get that. The, 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 yeah, we're going we're gonna to make space for him so he can come and we can see him and we can hear him. We get that. We get that. A voice of one calling in the desert or wilderness. Prepare the way for the... And this is where Mark lays it down and says, I'm not backing down. I'm not sugarcoating this. And I'm not going to make him out to be any less than who he is. I don't go to the natural language as much because it just confuses people. But the word for Lord there isn't the way you'd say, uh, yes, Lord, if you happen to be a servant in a house. It isn't the way you would speak to a, a member of royalty. The word Lord there is the personal covenant name given to Moses. The word Lord there was considered so holy by the Jews, it was not spoken and it was not written. Mark identifies Jesus as Yahweh as the creator God of the entire universe. Not just the guy who came and did a lot of good things, not just the guy who came and taught a lot, not just the guy who we believe we are proclaiming his resurrection from the dead. We're calling him the God, creator God of the universe. And that is a big step between what anybody was expecting the Messiah to be. If you're following along in your notes this morning, the king is among us. The king. The king is among us. How should we respond to this king? Well, a couple of things don't need to exist anymore. When the king's here, you don't need to have fear. A lot of us are driven by FOMO, fear of missing out, fear of failure, fear of financial ruin. And religion tends to make fear even worse because religion tends to say, hey, God is up there and we are horrible and we are down here and you've got to work really hard to get up to God. Uh, in Islam, you've got to fulfill the five pillars of Islam. In, uh, in Buddhism, you've got to fulfill the uh, eighth, I think it's eightfold path. And in Judaism, in Jews, you've got to fulfill all ten commandments so you can get to God. And then we walk around fearful whether we've done a good enough job. But in Christianity, God came to us. What Mark's talking about here in, in the passage in Mark chapter 1 is the incarnation. It's Christmas. It's God with us. And we don't have to walk as God comes close and offers himself to us. We can shift from fear to gratitude. And now that when suffering happens, only Christianity gives us this unique aspect of a God who suffers for his people. 
Other gods don't suffer. Other gods pour out suffering. Who's, who do they pour out suffering on? Our enemies. They're our God. My God is stronger than yours. That's why I can take you down. Yet our God comes in and comes down. God is near. Not just, and when you're going through suffering, we can look to our God, Jesus, and realize his suffering is more intense than any suffering we've been through. God coming down to us, not us climbing up to him because we can't reach it. If we had to reach up to him, he's unapproachable. But now he's huggable. If we got to reach up to him, it's like, whoa, he, he's, he's, he's invulnerable. He, he's impenetrable. But now he comes down and he's vulnerable, very vulnerable, very vulnerable. And now because it's God come near, the impossible is possible. And part of that impossible that's possible is a change that he can do in your heart at an altar today. So you can start chasing him like you know you want to be. So who's your king? Who's your ruler? Imagine your life surrendered to this king. The king is among us. Back to the passage, Mark chapter 1. A voice of one calling in the desert or in the wilderness. To meet this king, we pretty much have to go to the desert or the wilderness. John the Baptist is preaching about this king in the wilderness. He's preparing the way for his cousin. If you didn't know, John the Baptist and Jesus are actually cousins. They're not from Arkansas, just so that you know. But he's preaching in the wilderness or the desert. Jesus also goes into the wilderness. We'll see later in Mark chapter 1. Now, the word, word uh, desert is really well used here for an American translation because when we think wilderness, what do we think? Forest. Oregon. Peaceful. This is the desert. That is Israel. It's a photo I took. That's the wilderness that Mark, Mark would have been referring to. That's where you meet God. Not because you got to go ahead and uh, uh, strip down just a, uh, your loincloth and walk out there and humble yourself, but it's going to be a wilderness-type experience. The wilderness is a place that cannot sustain life all by itself. There's thorns, there's desolation. It's a place of thirst and dry wells. There may be a small little community of, uh, you know, Jabba the Hutts living out there somewhere kind of thing, but uh, they're, they're importing their water from somewhere. It cannot support life. It cannot support community. The only way you're going to survive in the wilderness is going to require God's intervention. And we've all been through a wilderness of one type or another. All throughout Scripture, God's people have found him in the wilderness. Moses, Jacob, the entire bit, family of Israel. God's not an add-on. He's essential. The king is among us, and you encounter this king in the desert or in the wilderness. I like the word wilderness better because it gives us the idea that it's wild, not just in terms of wild, in terms of it's a wild ride, but it's wild as an uncontrollable and untamable because we cannot control and tame our life. The more we try and control and tame our life, the more we take him off as our king and we put ourselves down as our own king. How did you come to Jesus? Was it after a mountaintop experience, after the best day of your life, after you won the Super Bowl, you won the Masters, and you bought low and sold high on, uh, on, on Wall Street, and then you said, man, I need Jesus? Or was it in the valley of the shadow? And you realized, whoa, how'd you come to him? You encounter this God in the desert, in the wilderness. How do you, how do you know what you're really trusting in? You know what you're really trusting in when, you, when it's threatened. You trust in your marriage? I hope you have a great marriage, but when it's threatened, and a lot of different things can threaten it. Do you trust in your ability to travel? Do you trust in your ability to learn? Do you trust in your ability for a strong intellect, your career, your family, your looks, your appearance, your finances, things that you have right now that are all performance-based? What happens when you can't perform anymore? We all understand the idea of a financial example. Hey, I'm financially successful. Then what happens if there's a financial reversal? And it had nothing to do with anything you could have done. All of a sudden you realize that the money wasn't just a nice thing. The money was the thing. The money was my source of, the money was my identity. Or it could be perform, job performance, it could be relationships, it could be your six-pack abs, or you're dreaming of six-pack abs. It could be your amazing family that you're super proud of. But when that falls apart, it's just another form of performance-based religion. Then we start getting thoughts about ourselves that aren't healthy. And then we start realizing my identity is melting down because I trusted in all these things I was doing and they're falling apart. So we go, I know what I'll do. I'll seek religion. I'm going to go ahead and be religious. Just another way of trying to save yourself that you can't live up to. 
Instead, we have a Savior who comes. He says, you can't reach me, but I can reach you. And the king does something that most kings don't do. What do kings do? Kings issue commands. This king, our king, issues an invitation. Kings don't take no for an answer. Kings don't wait for an answer. This king has been waiting for some of you to answer. Our king has been waiting for some of you to answer for a long time. Some of you answered years ago, but you never acted on it. He's your king in name only. You meet the king in the wilderness, in a desert place maybe, and your old foundation that you were trusting in is broken up because self-righteousness won't save. Imagine yourself surrendered to that king. Imagine yourself at the altar today, humbling yourself before that king. Well, I already believe in Jesus. Satan believes. Humble yourself before the king. Prepare the way for the Lord, the creator of the universe. You encounter this king in the desert, in the wilderness, and then Mark quotes what John the Baptist is actually doing, right? Preparing the way for the Lord. Prepare the way. Make straight paths for him. Have you ever seen a straight path in the forest? I don't think they exist, do they? Even the B&O trail has got a little bit of curve once in a while, right? Not that the train's going to do a 180, but prepare the way. A straight path. How are you going to get a straight path? Especially if this is first century and we're in a Roman territory. How are you going to get a straight path? You're going to have to do a lot of work. You're going to have to remove some stuff. Because in the, back in that day, if, if, the, if you were told the king's coming to your town, that's not good news. That means we got to build a road for him. We probably got to build a new house for him. We got we to gotta do all, we got to prepare for him. The whole baptism thing. That you see John doing is a visible sign that new life has happened. I'm preparing space for him. I'm making space in my life. When we had baptisms on Easter, the old man is going down, the new is coming up. It's not turning a new page. It's I'm closing the book on the old me. He must increase and I must decrease. For him to increase in me, there's got to be less of me. How do I get less of me? Because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty full of me. Are you full of you? Spouses don't point at each other right now. Just, just don't. Nobody was doing that. Is the path to your heart straight shot for God? Or does he have to dance around things you've told him, you're not welcome here? Does he have to dance around things that you won't surrender? And that stops him from getting to your core. John's message was prepare people to accept Jesus. And you've had many moments in your life, perhaps, where God's used you to help prepare people, to help prepare the way, so that someone could have a straight or straighter path. So the closing question today is this. Have you made way for this king? I mean, can you picture it if it's a Monty Python episode? Make way! Make way! You know, walk this way! Make way! Make way for what? The scriptures say make way for the king. What king? The king. The creator of the universe. The one who made it happen so that pretty much only humans, from what we can tell, only humans on this planet get a chance to see a total solar eclipse. Mark uses a, a unique word when he's talking about the road. Because uh, this road... All throughout the Gospel of Mark only refers to a path that leads to one spot. That's a cross. Kings go to thrones, not crosses. Kings condemn people to crosses. Not our king. Not our king. Our king takes our place. Thrones. Thrones represent power, authority. The cross represents helplessness, powerlessness. And our king took on powerlessness for us. Jesus went through the ultimate wilderness so he can rescue you in yours. 
He walked into the ultimate desert of being forsaken so he can rescue you in yours. Meeting the real Jesus is going to require an extreme reaction. As we go through the Gospel of Mark, we're, we actually don't see much of Jesus' teaching in there. We see Jesus' is doing. And every time Jesus does something, people respond. People always respond to Jesus. People always respond. And as we take a look, what we're going to see is the only kind of responses Jesus got were extreme. There was extreme full devotion. Full devotion to who he was. There was an extreme response of absolute fear. Oh my goodness, who is this guy that the wind and the waves obey him? I'm terrified. And there's also the extreme response of complete hatred. We must kill him. The only rational responses to Jesus are extreme. No one who's actually met Jesus thought, oh, what a nice guy. I know people, Pastor, think Jesus is a nice guy. Then they haven't really understood him. No one has no opinion on Jesus. Rhetorical questions as we close, and the worship team should be making their way up. Do you follow Christ? And if so, did it cost you a lot to follow him? Or are you still exactly the same person you were when you started following him? Obviously, if you're actually following Christ, he's changed you. Now let's go one step harder. I'm not asking you, did it cost you to follow Christ? Does it still cost you to follow Christ? And if it doesn't cost you anything anymore to follow Christ, and if your response to him is not an extreme response, I question whether you've actually met him or whether you're actually following him, or you're just following a religion and a version of him that makes your heart feel good. There's nothing wrong with feel good, but feel good is not spiritual transformation. He's not trying to get good, bad people to be good. He's trying to help dead people come to life. That's what he does. A king issues commands. Our king is issuing an invitation. But heads up, this invitation he is giving you even right now is going to turn in to a command after death. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We just get to choose whether we're going to do it willingly now or we're going to wait until we're commanded. Our king right now gives you the opportunity to turn down his invitation or respond to it. Stand with me, would you?